to our first Wednesday. Uh, it's good to see uh, some familiar faces. And if you haven't joined us before, um, welcome. We are fortunate to today, uh, as the DA abroad hosting this first Wednesday, to have with us uh, Natasha Mazzoni, who is uh, an MP and the DA chief whip. And she is going to be uh, giving us a little bit of a insight from the front line. We've all, uh, most well, I imagine all of us have, we're quite glued to our phones, uh, getting updates uh, by the hour of what was going on in South Africa just recently in past weeks. That, that initial um, chaos, at least in certain parts, has calmed down and, um, the big question is, what what caused it? Uh, what are the key drivers? And essentially, what what is next? And and there's a lot of uh, different views and theories flying around. So, um, the best uh, way to find out a little bit more is to hand over to Natasha, who will have a, an insight from the front line. So, thank you very much for joining us, Natasha. And thank you very much. Yeah, we, we look forward to, to hearing a little bit more about of, of your, your insight as to uh, the background and, and what, uh, you know, what it means for South Africa. Obviously, no one can tell, but, but what the expectations are going forward. Great. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thanks uh, very much for having me. It's always uh, one of the highlights of, my, of the calendar when I, I get invited to DA Abroad. Um, I must say what worries me is um, as I look under the names of participants, how many of you I know and how many of you uh, I used to um, jaw with in Pretoria back in the day. So uh, far too many of us are overseas and I want you all back home. And I'm afraid that the news I give you tonight is going to perhaps defeat my purpose of um, always trying to get as many South Africans back home as I, as I possibly can. Look, I'm going to be completely frank and honest, because I think that that's, that's where we are in life and, and where we have to be. In the last week, I have done nothing but help uh, South Africans uh, with their applications for passports, for unabridged marriage certificates, for unabridged birth certificates, because so many South Africans are leaving home. And uh, I'm afraid that DA Abroad is going to become by far uh, one of our largest uh, voting demographics. And um, it's, it's a great pity because I know all of you, as much as you are happy where you are and you have your reasons for immigrating, I know you all miss home. And I know that uh, you all keep a very close eye on, on what's, what's happening at home. And it's a, it's a very, very sad situation. I think um, you would have heard me say many times before that we are at the, the very edge of the cliff. Well, I can now quite confidently tell you that we have fallen off the edge of the cliff. And it's now a case of whether or not the parachute deploys in time uh, for us to save what we can and, and what is left to save. And that's a damn scary prospect. It's a scary prospect for those of you that uh, still have family living here. It's a sad prospect for those of you that used to call South Africa home. And uh, it's a very, very sad prospect being a, a member of parliament uh, and knowing and watching your, your democracy decay and degenerate the way uh, ours has and in such a sudden in such a sudden movement that I think that's what the, the scary part was. So, I mean, all of you watch the state capture inquiries. Um, you know, I've often had chats and webinars uh, on, on these groupings, um, not, not on Zoom, I may add, it was uh, when we could still meet in person and we would have it in a, you'd all meet up in a room somewhere, get off at the Liverpool station, I believe it was, and then gather somewhere to have a, a, a meeting with us. But, um, Firstly, COVID is not the reason our economy is destroyed. Our economy was destroyed before COVID ever hit South African shores. Our economy was destroyed because 1.5 trillion rand was stolen through state capture. And we started out at the very um, sort of 
early stages saying it was, you know, roughly a, just under a trillion rand. And now we're talking about 1.5 trillion and it, it could be even more. I mean, we just, we just really don't know. Every day we're uncovering more. And the biggest question I always got was, well, no one's been arrested yet. Uh, no one's being held accountable. What's going on? And now finally what's happened is number one himself has been held accountable. And here's what, what worries us and what keeps up, us awake at night is that this particular prison sentence that he is serving is not for his role in state capture and his role in um, how he looted from our company, uh, our company, listen to me, our country. It's just for the fact that he did not appear in court. So we're expecting there to be um, a rocky road ahead of us. Um, but I want to give you a few examples that are going to give you hope and, and give you perhaps that little bit of um, push that you needed to remind you why you take time to be in the Democratic Alliance, even though you're abroad, and why the DA remains uh, the, the, and, and is the only party at the moment that holds the country to account. When we realized that this wasn't a sporadic act of violence or an outbreak of violence that was caused by ethnic, you know, all these excuses that it was an ethnic grouping that had taken to the streets and, you know, it was a very small minority of people. When we realized that this was actually an insurgence that was taking place, an insurrection in South Africa, uh, we immediately uh, got our defense, uh, Shadow Minister for Defense, Corbus Marais, to set up a work stream. What we have now, uh, because of COVID, we have the DA has its own COVID council, I chair it. And uh, what that enables me to do is it enables me to talk and communicate with our public reps on in all the different levels of government. Um, it enables us to connect with public reps from our sister parties, um, and elsewhere across the world, some uh, liberal Democrats, um, we can connect with uh, international organizations and um, it really helps us uh, sort of spread the information and, and disseminate information. But more importantly, we turned out to be the ones gathering the information. So I can tell you that our, our version of MI6, which is the South African um, intelligence agency, I don't know if any of you have ever seen uh, Mr. Bean's uh, James Bond 007 movie. Well, that's what our, our South African Secret Service can be uh, aligned with. It's an absolute joke. And we were the ones, in fact, giving information to uh, the intelligence services as well as to the SANDF as to where the next uh, violent outbreaks were going to happen. We managed to get Twitter to shut down certain accounts that were um, aiding um, in the spreading of, of uh, propaganda so that people would know where to gather. Uh, there were no soldiers on the ground. Corbus Marais managed to get on the, on the horn to our Minister of Defence. It started out with 2,500 soldiers, and by the time the DA had thrown their full weight behind um, getting behind this operation of getting soldiers on the ground, we had 25,000 soldiers deployed into KZN. So what that meant is we forced uh, the government to uh, call up reservists. Uh, we called up retired military but I'll tell you, and anyone that, that, that is in South Africa will tell you that not a word of what I say is a lie. South Africans in Kauteng and in KZN were themselves protecting the police. They were protecting each other. Um, they were protecting uh, stores, uh, huge stores like macros and manufacturing companies. Uh, it was... Uh, quite alarming how many South Africans were so well armed. Um, but also, uh, we were also very grateful, quite frankly, that so many South Africans were armed because it was a case of South Africans looking after the police and not the, the other way around. So we've lost what we know. Uh, we estimated to be just under 310 people dead. They're not uh, completely sure because they, they're finding, I mean, this is how, how desperate the situation was. They're finding charred bodies. 
still as they go through the rubble of the of the leftovers because you you, you must understand that the KZN that you left uh, in South Africa is not the KZN that you'll be coming back to. Um, it's, a, it's a very, very different uh, province. And uh, John and I were constantly in contact with, with one another. Now, because of the Disaster Management Act, the chief whips stay near parliament, that you have to stay within a certain mileage of parliament. Because if they have to, if there's an emergency vote that needs to take place or an emergency decision that needs to be, that needs to take place that requires um, a vote with the party, the chief whips then go and represent the whole party. I'm sure some of you may have seen on TV when I stand up and I do the vote on behalf of the DA. So that's what we do during the time of COVID. So John got on a plane, he, he got down to KZN, he landed at eight o'clock in the morning. And um, at nine o'clock, he phoned me and he said to me, I feel like I'm walking on a set of The Walking Dead. He said, I've just turned a corner and there's seven dead people just lying here. There's just seven dead people lying in the road. He said, and I, 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 there's, I don't see police. He said, I, I, I don't see anyone. Um, we had to get John out of that area very quickly because gunshots started going off and, um, you know, obviously John doesn't have guards and things like that. So we had our public reps looking after him. So we got him out of that area and then we got him to a central secure area where we started um, him on the operations on the ground, feeding operations up to me and then me feeding the operations through to our, our various work streams. And we had our, our own national joint intelligence service and uh, our defense work stream going. So it was um, about eight days of no sleep of, uh, you know, you catch an hour's sleep and then you wake up to find 380 WhatsApps on your phone and then you start going through them. And, and so everyone was, was very involved. But, um, it was it it was it was beyond anyone's wildest imaginations i you know i'm the i think you all know i'm the child of immigrant parents my parents are, are italian and we had friends who lived in the congo and they woke up from one day from it being normal to the next day there being a civil war and i always thought to myself well, it was a bit of an exaggeration well we also we went to bed one night and things were normal and we woke up the next day and Macro was being burned down and every shop was being burned to the ground and Belito was, you know, people were, were cordoning off Belito and they were looking after their estates and Gauteng, Soweto and Alex were on fire. I mean, things that, you know, we, we certainly never saw, you know, we, we didn't think we'd ever see the likes of, but that's what we saw. So it's, it's given us a massive, a massive shock. Um, and I hate to say that because uh, I sound a bit like Cyril now when I say I'm shocked, but I think even uh, even the government itself was 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 shaken to the very core, um, and I'm very glad that they're now calling it what it is, which was uh, it was a, a failed an attempt at a failed coup, um, and we're very lucky because I mean this is this is the situation had had they got right what what they thought they would have got right. In other words, had South Africans not stood up and defended themselves and their province the way they did is we could very well have landed up with a Jacob Zuma presidency with Ace Makashule being the leader of government business or a Ace Makashule, a, 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 an Ace Makashule presidency with David Mabuza as the leader of government business. So we're fighting an immense battle uh, here on, 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 on the motherland soil. But um, we know exactly what we're doing. And um, the, the DA has led the charge. We've got the president to finally agree to have meetings uh, on a more regular basis with John. And they actually had a, a very good meeting about a week and a half ago. Um, yeah, it was, yeah, a week and a half ago, they had a good meeting where they discussed what was gonna happen. Um, obviously we, you know, the, the problem is, our guys and girls on the on the safety and security team, um, they're our 007s. So they they take an oath and they have to sign a contract. And just like any spy in the world, they the their meetings are confidential. 
So they can't have a portfolio committee meeting. And then Diane Colabarnard, who's our shadow minister of, of, of state security, she can't come into my office and say to me, Tash, look, this is what we discussed. This is what that, this is what we're doing. She she can't do that. Uh, it's against the law. It's it's against you know. It's and we wouldn't we wouldn't let her do that anyway. We wouldn't let her compromise herself, or or compromise the law. So what we do is we deal we deal mainly with defence and police, so that we can make sure the the feet on the ground. Now, why this confusion? I know many of you are going to ask, and it's it's quite simple. It's because in the defence cluster and in Parliament, all, all portfolios are put into clusters. So the economics cluster, anything to do with the finance of this country goes into a cluster. And you can imagine what kind of cluster that is. Uh, and then you've got the, the, the justice cluster and that's justice, defense, safety and security, uh, you know, states, uh, the state intelligence agency. And the state intelligence agency, what they are supposed to do is gather information. They're supposed to gather intelligence. So in other words, there should be eyes and ears on the ground doing exactly what we, you know, we all fear Big Brother doing, you know, watching, listening, monitoring social media, monitoring the way things are, are you know, developing on the ground. And they then hand over a dossier to the police because they themselves don't have the capacity to send out police or send out uh, uh, cops or the SANDF, they have to they have to give a reason why that action is taken, and the fight now, and and why it's so difficult, is because we have the RET faction, the Radical Economic Transformation, Zuma, ACE faction, as half of the cluster. And then as the other half of the cluster, we have the Ramaphosa faction. And that's where it becomes this very dangerous knife's edge, could tilt either way kind of game that we're in right now. But without a shadow of a doubt, even the government realized that if the DA hadn't intervened and hadn't shown our expertise and hadn't shown the way we were so supremely organized um, and the way we could gather the information and the way we could form ourselves into these various clusters as quickly as we did, um, that there would have been, I mean, things would have been a lot worse. And um, even the public, those who were completely, completely anti us, those who were just too joyful at the fact that the DA was a white-led party once again, those who loved referring to me as the, you know, the, the Italian chief whip, even they, you know, had to keep their mouths quiet and, and you know, had to just, you know, take their hats off to, to a job really well done. Um, so I'm very proud of what we've done, but I'm still very nervous. Our cluster's on standby. We meet uh, sort of every second to third day as we as we need to, as information comes in and we feed it down to our different work streams. Next week is gonna be a very telling week for South Africa. Next week, we're expecting a cabinet reshuffle and quite frankly, it shouldn't be a reshuffle. And I said this and I hope they quote me directly because they don't often quote directly enough. But the business day, for those of you that remember, it's the it's the more serious sort of business person's newspaper in South Africa, asked me what I thought of this cabinet reshuffle. And I said, well, firstly, it shouldn't be a reshuffle. People should just get fired, not just shifted around. I said, and secondly, the pickings are incredibly slim. So I'm not expecting too much, you know, the two greatest shakes from whatever we get from this. But we are going to have a cabinet reshuffle. It's on the cards. Uh, we've got Sura Ramaphosa himself testifying at uh, the request of myself and the Democratic Alliance at the Zonda Commission next week. And uh, you must remember that at the Zonda Commission so far, there's been very few people who haven't been cross-examined or whose evidence hasn't been refuted. James Self gave evidence about correctional services, in other words, the Basasa scandal, and I gave evidence about Zondo. And I handed in an affidavit, which was uh, just short of 1,400 uh, pages. And I handed in evidence um, that was just short of about 8,000 pages. And not one piece of our evidence 
all any of our affidavits have been questioned or requested a cross-examination. Therefore, it means it's taken as, as the truth, which of course we know it is, but you know, other people try and squirm out of it. So you never ask a question in these particular um, commissions that you don't already know the answer to, because that defeats the purpose. So that's why we are insisting that Cyril Ramaphosa testifies um, next week and not in his capacity as president where he can blame his ministers. He's going to do so in his capacity as head of the CADA deployment program of the ANC, which he was uh, as deputy president in the what he termed the nine wasted years, and also as the leader of government business. Uh, I must tell you, I've just noticed on my screen that a very close friend of mine has just joined us, uh, Kate Lorimer, um, one of the best uh, public reps uh, the DA ever had in, in the South African segment and certainly a great asset to DA abroad. Kate, it's good to see you in another form, but it's it's just good to see your name. It, it, it's it's lovely to to know that you you're still involved with us, even though you're not here with us. I could I could do with a, a Kate chat on the phone and some comfort. But um this is this is what this is this is the position that we find ourselves in. So um let me tell you that people are asking me should we immigrate? If people had asked me that question a year ago, six months ago, I would have said, to what? To what is actually better? And after the last month, this question is becoming harder and harder for me to answer because I can see that people with children, um, you want a better life and you want a life where you know that if there is an uprising of some kind, the police will come and it won't be your neighborhood watch that that in the end takes care of you. It's not going to be you defending your home. And um, it's a question that, that I, I will always say to people, I would prefer that you stay at home and fight alongside me. But now what I do is I say you're overseas and I need you to fight for me overseas and be the overseas voice for us, because the more the international community know what's going on in this country, the more power we have, not only as opposition, but we have as a general public. Because let me tell you, there is no way, no how, the ANC will hold on to their 50% majority. The EFF have basically rendered themselves irrelevant because they've had a few marches during the COVID period, which people, even their most loyal supporters, have said was just the, the work of complete maniacs, which let's be honest, that's exactly what we're dealing with. You know, you're dealing with a maniac fascist leader. Um, and so many people have caught COVID at these, at these marches that the marches become irrelevant. There's a march planned for um, this week. We went from uh, Julius Malema screaming, uh, Zuba must pay back the money to now get him out of jail. So it's, it's hard to understand where they're coming from. But the party that, that really holds ground and has now shown what it can do in the time of crisis is the Democratic Alliance. But we need your help. Let me be perfectly frank, we need your pounds, we need your euros. So uh, when you get a phone call to, you know, with us begging, please remember that, that we're keeping the, the home fires burning and, and we're doing the best we can with the little that we've got. We've been hit very hard by COVID, very hard. We have a government of imbeciles who sent back a massive amount of the AstraZeneca uh, uh, vaccine, a million doses, they sent and sold to the, the African Union when we could have started uh, the, the vaccine program months ago. The vaccine program is still only open to those owned over the age of 35. So um, we're having big problems. Um, our hospitals are completely overrun. Uh, some of our hospitals uh, are still closed. We have oxygen shortages. Um, People are really suffering. Um, if you go to Cape Town, I don't know, those of you that used to live in Cape Town, I'm sure you remember what Bree Street used to look like. All the restaurants, all the pavement cafes, 
imagine um, one eighth of them now open because that's what you have. Uh, think back to Parkhurst, to the Joe Burgers, to the to the cafes, the street cafes. It's not like that anymore. A lot of shops are restaurants are closed. The restaurant industry incredibly hard hit, and mostly because of this extremely strange alcohol law that was was passed in the country. Um, what we do know is that the Zuma faction made an absolute fortune of the banning of alcohol and the banning of cigarettes. And uh, now, now we're dealing with the, with the economic fallout of that. So my, my friends, my fellow countrymen all over the world and, and, and DA abroad in general, I paint you a grim picture, but I paint you the truth. Um, but what I can tell you is that we are doing everything that we can to, to make South Africa come alive again as much as we can. We're pushing for the vaccine. Um, herd immunity is not taking, it's not taking, uh, there's no way we'll, we can reach herd, uh, herd immunity in South Africa. So that's a, a wish that we'll never receive in, in any event. Um, we have, uh, you know, our only chance of getting through this is to vaccinate because as you know, people in our country can't, there just simply isn't a way for them to self-isolate for the majority of South Africans, um, both white, black, Indian colored. It's just, it's not a possibility anymore. Um, people have to go back to work. People have to take public transport. So it's, it's not a good situation. So you find a, a pretty depressed um, uh, chief whip but also a chief whip who's incredibly proud of the work that our party has done. Now, I see that my dearest friend, her name is appearing on my screen, and I'm just going to click to see what she could say. Uh, ah, Kate said, could you please talk a bit about the proposed uh, postponement of the election and the threat to democracy? Well, Kate, you know that today uh, we don't, we, we're sitting in a very interesting situation where out of nowhere, a government gazette arrived this today um, declaring the election happening on the 27th of October. And then the IEC said, wait, hold on, you, you can't just declare that the election's happening. We're still busy working out whether it's safe, whether it's secure, whether we, we have enough time to, to, to do registration. Um, we now heard it's going to the Concord um, and they won't allow political parties to, to add their voice to it because they say that over 600 political parties would then have um, a right to be a, a joiner in the court case. So, um, Kate, imagine complete and utter chaos. Then multiply it by 10, then multiply that by 10 again. And that's what we're dealing with when we're trying to figure out what this communication is coming from our famous uh, Nkosuzana Glamini Zuma fighting with the fighting with the IEC now. And we're trying to work out ourselves. When are they going to have the registration weekend? Uh, how are they going to, you know, is the money there? Because now we know that we've spent a, a fortune of, of money on, uh, you know, buying new vaccines and now we've had to open UIF again and the tours again for people who, who lost their job when we went back down into a hard lockdown of two weeks which was then extended to four weeks so it's a damn mess um, that's what it is um, the effect that it has on democracy is frightening because what you do when you stop having regular free and fair elections you start turning into a dictatorship and you start turning into the failed state and as i said to you all we've already gone over the cliff now we have to deploy that parachute and for us that parachute at the moment is the election it's it's where we can really hit the 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 anc at the ballot box and i'm going to be very blunt about this i don't want us going into coalition with anyone these coalitions don't work. They are an absolute nightmare. There is no way the DA can go into a coalition that involves the EFF. They are nothing but a bunch of fascist thugs. And one just has to see the way they behave, the way they talk, the, everything about their behavior. So it's, it's, it's a very difficult situation to get people to understand that although you have absolute democratic right to choose any party in which you think uh, your belief system lies, you actually have to now think strategically for the party. So even if, even if the DA has irritated you, 
even if you have you're a resident in Pretoria and you know that the DA hasn't done a good enough job in Pretoria, because I'm the first one who will tell you that we haven't done a good enough job in Pretoria, because we had the EFF holding up the handbrake, we had uh, an ANC admin come in and try and take over, we're now trying to govern again, we built up the, the coffers to just over 4 billion rand, that 4 billion rand was stolen in the six months that the city was under admin, it's a hot mess. So let's not put ourselves in the situation that we have to deal with coalition governments. We're too younger of a generation to deal with coalitions yet. It requires a mature democracy. And I think many of you live in countries where you have a, a coalition. I'm sure there's some of you that are in, it, are, are in Italy coming in live from Italy. I don't have to tell you what a coalition government is like. Um, some of you are coming in from Holland, I see, you know, beaming in, in live from, from Holland. You know, you make you make a mistake in the Dutch government and, you know, your government resigns. Well, that's not how it happens here. Um, Jordan says, if we postpone the elections, does that mean the local government elections won't exist five years from the, lo from the last local election? Well, it depends because our constitution is very strict that you have a, a five-year term with a grace period in between. Um, so what the ANC and what the EFF, I think their dream would be was is to have the elections together. Um, and I'll tell you why. Mostly you find at the local government election, the DA has a stronger call out and a, and a stronger pool than it does in a national election. And that's because people feel a lot easier uh, with the first small step of giving the DA the chance to be their government on a local level. And then when you start talking about national level, you talk about who your president will be and what national laws can be passed. And there is such a deep and entrenched um, hurt and fear in our country that it's still very difficult for many South Africans to understand that it's just pure propaganda to think that the DA uh, wouldn't bring back apartheid. You and I both know that. You know exactly what our party stands for. We know who are, you know, who we are and, and, and what, why we exist. But the propaganda will always be that the DA is a majority white party and that will bring back apartheid. So that, that's why we would never want the two, the two elections to coexist. And that's why all over the world. Um, it's it's good to separate the, the elections and to have a, a national election versus uh, a, a local government election. Um, well, Sasha, would you would you like me to read uh, any other of the uh, questions out to you? Absolutely, because I can only see the ones that <laughs> pop up on my screen very occasionally. I know um, that it's, yeah, it can get quite busy, so I can okay. I can read out one or two of these. Um, okay. okay. From Justin, a yeah. question from a broader perspective, it seems like the ANC is plowing on with its nation, nationalization policies, expropriation without compensation, prescribed assets, and NHI have all come up in recent weeks. It feels like this is something we should be concerned about. What are your thoughts? Yeah, Justin, uh, these are things that keep me up at night. That's that's my, my first thought is I'd love I'd love an eight hour night sleep first, but I can't because all I think about is expropriation without compensation. Um, you do realize, and and I can tell by Justin's question that he realizes that it's not just land that can be expropriated. It's it's all your property can be expropriated. That's your bank accounts. It's your shares. It's your pensions. Um, Look, there is now mass confusion. There is now a broad agreement that the EFF and the ANC will not vote together on this particular issue. The ANC has changed its stance this last week about three or four times. Um, the, the negotiations are ongoing, but they are very, very difficult. We are trying to prove, and I think that we, we, we've already started proving beyond reasonable doubt, that you, you would just absolutely destroy any chance of economic, uh, you know, international economic investment if you had any kind of, uh, in, any kind of this radical economic change that they're talking about. Expropriation without compensation simply cannot happen. Um, the Zimbabwe model fell, fell apart. We, I mean, it's on our very border that it fell apart that we can see. So yes, there has been a lot of talk about this. 
NHS, I think, uh, you know, if anyone ever tries to argue NHS for South Africa, we just have to refer them to the Eastern Cape, where billions of rands were spent on scooters with sidecars that were going to be used as ambulances for COVID patients who couldn't breathe. Um, and I think that uh, when we look at our, our Minister of Health, Zwilliam Kizi, who's now been uh, suspended, um, involved in one of the, the biggest scandals, corruption scandals at the moment. So the digital vibe scandal. So I mean, there, there's, there's a million and one reasons we can give them why it wouldn't work. And I can tell you that we can keep the Concord busy for years because there is no way the DA will throw the towel in. Um, through very kind sponsorship, we managed to get our court cases going. And people say, oh, you just whine all the time and you're in court all the time. And uh, well, you know what? That whining got the economy reopened. It got e-commerce going again. There was a time in South Africa last year where you couldn't buy a Woolworths rotisserie chicken and you couldn't buy a hot pie from the, from the local cafe. And uh, you were being told what clothes you could buy by Abraham Patel. And the DA whined enough that we got that economy up and going again. And uh, we got the uh, alcohol industry opened again. We got the tobacco industry open again. And I don't care if you smoke or not, uh, if you're pro-smoking or not, that's not the issue here. The issue is that the billions of tax rain that come in from the sale of these products. Um, that's what we need to worry about. So, I mean, there's, there's no way any of these projects can work. And I think that, you know, it's nice for the ANC to, you know, to utter these words. And I think that for many ANC branch members, they themselves are not sure what, what it means. Um, and they're just told what to tell people. But um, the, the idea is certainly rapidly losing favor amongst uh, South Africans. And uh, finally, some of the journalists have come on board because we have had a very hostile media towards the DA. Uh, it's been a, a dreadful time with, with the DA um, and the media. That's why we've started our own media channels. I do hope um, that you guys watch and catch up on the inside track, which is either hosted by uh, MP Saviwe Guarube or uh, MP Salias Brink. It depends who's in Cape Town um, on the day. We've got a full studio uh, that we've set up in, in our offices in Cape Town, very professional outfit. Um, and, and we deal with these things there. John has his letter that he sends out and we've got a very active uh, social media department, which I hope you all keep up um, so that you can see what we're doing. Uh, but certainly Justin, we, we, we're fighting them all the way and um, we'll take them all the way to Concord and we will keep them tied up in litigation for years um, if that's what it takes over, over, over my dead body. So, uh, and, and that's how we all feel. So um, that, that's where we are. But we've got, like I said, we've got real experts working on this stuff for us. And um, again, I mean, Dr. Anneli Lotrit runs our um, expropriation without compensation work stream. And um, they've done a massive amount of work, a massive amount of research, had fantastic help from DA abroad. Um, you, the, and, and you guys think that, that it's not realized and it's not noticed. But let me tell you that when you manage to get a BBC reporter to call one of us or a CNN reporter phones us, or we find out that a question or a debate is being raised in the House of Commons, you have no idea how much that assists us in our work here. So please never think that the contributions you make over there for us are not noticed. They are noticed tremendously and they are appreciated more than you could possibly imagine. Thanks, Natasha. I'll, I'll actually probably take a moment to just mention um, on that note, we usually do do two things on these on these. Um, these sessions are obviously extremely informative and very useful for people over here. Um, we just do also like to mention that obviously this this is organized by the DA Broad. If there is anyone who is uh, living abroad and wants to uh, participate and wants to contribute in some way, I do encourage you to, to get in touch uh, with us. Uh, on the invite, you will have seen the, the email address there. There are a lot of different things like, like Natasha mentioned, um, uh, whether it be on the political side, whether it be on the media side, um, a lot of different, obviously running, uh, 
running protests and so on, whether it be Bell Pottinger or in the Zuma years, um, a lot a lot does go on. And and then also, <clears throat> obviously, something that's very important to note to notice as well, because obviously everyone is sitting here um, far away from South Africa, watching, uh, no doubt, with friends or family or interests in South Africa, but we do often we we ask to for a contribution uh for for example a beer the cost of a beer or a cup of coffee now natasha um this is something we always do we always do encourage people to 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 really to contribute a small amount uh for fundraising but instead of me saying why um perhaps you could just shed a bit of light as to um there there is a the uh, link for the DA abroad has been shared in the in the WhatsApp group, and also Lance, if you can share that fundraising link. Now, Natasha, maybe you can shed some light into what what difference uh, people uh, contributing uh, money to the DA abroad on a monthly basis would make, or the DA, sorry. So I mean, you know, I, I know I sound like a, you know one of those cult leaders that begs for money, and it's. I know everyone's gone through a tough time through COVID, but this is this is what happens with your with the money when you when you donate money to the DA. Portions of that money go to fighting court cases, and in South Africa, our court system is is our last sort of hope. Our constitutional court is our last is our last hope. It's our last uh, port of call to to you know it's it's our last line of defence in many cases. And you can see that the court has, has stood its test. It was tested at its very highest order and it passed its test with flying colors. So a lot of the money that, that you would donate to us goes, go, goes through to court cases. We also then have a, a staff which we've trimmed down dramatically. Um, and we now run on the very basics that you need to run an operation and a machinery the size of the Democratic Alliance. Uh, we also have an election coming up. Now, elections are never easy to fight, and they are very expensive operations to fight. Um, so the money you would be donating would be going to things like T-shirts, which are walking adverts for the Democratic Alliance, uh, billboards um, with our DA messages. It would go to uh, flighting of posters along the streets. And uh, I was always one of those people that used to think posters did nothing more than just irritate me, clog up our suburbs, and I, and I thought they were never worth anything. Until I actually sat down and I, I really interrogated and I had someone in our polling department explain to me how much value those posters bring to an election. And there's something about a show de force of your posters going up that influences the election result. Without doubt, my mind has been completely changed. But those posters are expensive and maintenance of those posters are expensive. Um, we have radio ads, we have television adverts, and um, I can guarantee you, and this is, I mean, this is one of the wonderful things about the Democratic Alliance, because you, you are a member, you, you have absolute right to see things in the DA. So you can, you can ask to see what perks the leader gets, if any, and I can tell you that your leader, John Steenhuizen, gets no perks. He took no car, no guards, no nothing. So things, I mean, this, this entire leadership has changed the way we do things dramatically. So you can make sure that like no one's skimming off the top by getting some kind of perk or a car or a, a you know an allowance or anything like that. But we do at times um, require members to travel around the country. We've got a whole team that's going around the country at the moment, gathering intelligence for our work stream 